Welcome, everyone, to the What Would You Change movie podcast. We are the Super Monkey Fighters. I am Loki, here with Papa Nugget and Monkey Feathers. And this week, uh, we are going to go through uh, One Night in Bangkok, um, which is really called Last Night in Soho. <laughs> But for I was some about reason, to make a joke. My, I was about to make a joke that this is where you find out we all watched a completely different movie different than movie. each other. Well, <laughs> this joke also has layers because this film's uh, one of the stars is Anya Taylor Joy, who was in The Queen's Gambit, which is about chess. And the song One Night in Bangkok is about a chess tournament. So layers of jokes, especially when they're explained, because they're always better when they're explained. Always better. Um, always. So really, this is the film Last Night in Soho. Uh, Directed by Edgar Wright, written by Edgar Wright, and Christy Wilson Cairns. It stars Thomas and McKenzie, Anya Taylor-Joy, Matt Smith, Diana Riggs, Michael Ajeo, and Terrence Stamp. It's an aspiring fashion designer who's mysteriously able to enter the 1960s, where she encounters a dazzling wannabe singer, but the glamour is not all it appears to be, and the dreams of the past start to crack and splinter into something darker. Thoughts on this movie? Who wants to go first? Because I don't. I will start. I don't have a lot of good things written down about this. Um, but I <laughs> did. I will say it is visually stimulating. Um, there's a lot of. It, it was it's definitely a, a film that is has a lot going on to catch your eye um, with the animation, just a lot of the camera work. Um, and it's kind of a, a good and maybe a bad at the same time on some of it. I felt like there were a lot of like, I felt like parlor tricks and like the whole mirror thing with her. I, I was like, okay, like I, I felt like it was, I didn't like it. Like it, it was, it was an interesting gimmick for me. But there were times where it was like, "This is just disorienting." Yeah, and not in a way that fits the movie well. Like, I feel but, like I don't know what's going on, and I'm just confused, just to be confused, rather than I'm confused in a way that fits the story. Like it's, it didn't help the story move forward for me to just not understand what I was looking at. Exactly. And it almost that early on in especially because that was like the initial like dream sequence thing. Like and like, is she her? Like, so I felt like it, it, it did more to to confuse me as a viewer as to what they were trying to mean by that. It, it didn't solidify anything. It just distracted me more than it didn't enrich the plot, the story, or the characters to me by using it. And it was it was difficult to kind of tell who was in control. Yeah. Like because it's it's and that's the thing is it's just it's not really established. And it sometimes it seems like Ellie's traveled back in time in a dream and she's controlling what's going on. And sometimes it seems like she's just a passenger. Passenger. She's just there to watch, unfortunately. Like and it seems to go back and forth, but it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it kind of solidifies itself more into she's not in control, except for those shots where she is in control. So it seemed like there's a, like a, a pull pulling of control, like back and forth is what it feels like. It, I mean, it was, it seemed very stylized and it's kind of trying to do the nostalgia of sixties London. I thought, All of that was good. Like, I'm not an expert on 60s London, but I felt like it worked. Well, it It didn't not feel like 60s London to me. Yeah, I I don't know what 1960s London was like, but that very much felt like an idealized version of it, especially early on in those. And then it kind of as the polish wears off on it, like it, it does feel very stylized, but appropriate for someone's memory or visions or their thoughts belief, of, yeah. of that, their belief of what yeah, it is and like. Yeah, and it's Ellie's, like, like that's, like, her, 
like she she's never been there, but she just has this this fascination or like love of it. So it's even more heightened probably in her expectation. And I, I thought thought they did a good job with trying to to show how her uh, kind of belief in her idea of what 60s London is isn't yeah. what it really it was or is or becomes yeah. however you want to look at it, I guess. Um, so I, th- I thought that was a good portrayal of that kind of uh, reality yeah. of her expectation. I'll agree with what Nugget had mentioned about, you know, the stylization of this movie. I actually really liked it, especially when you go from kind of the more dark and stormy part of London in present day to the I idolized, fantasized version of the 60s that this main character walks into. It's... I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I felt it, I would say, like beautiful and eye candy for a lot of myself in just watching this that you incorporate with the music as well. It's, I felt it worked for what they were trying to go for. And so that was something that I really did enjoy. I'll also say that for the most part, I actually did like the camera work and the, the one scene that really kind of drew my eye was the dance scene between Jack and uh, Anya's character. Sandy. Sandy, Sandy. yes. Where they're dancing on the floor, but then the camera's kind of like moving around them, and then it's transitioning between the two girls. I felt that that was done very well without, I guess, giving away the, the secret to how they did it. So that was a that was a nice scene to watch. And... Just kind of the, I guess the transitions between each girl as the camera's moving and you're bouncing between uh, Sandy's character and I guess Ellie's character where one's running and then the camera will swoop and do something and then there'll be the other girl. And I actually really enjoyed that camera work to help kind of establish that, you know, they are two characters, but one character and you know, to help. Yeah. Well, it'd be interesting to see like behind the scenes, how they did that and see if it was a mix of practical and digital. Cause I'm pretty sure it was because there were some things where it was, it wasn't as seamless as it could be where somebody's going off screen. Somebody's coming on screen kind of a thing. Like it's just one of the things where it's like, Oh, this person ed- exited off the right hand of the screen. They're going to come in on the left hand of the screen and it's somebody else. Like those are obvious little um, signs or, somebody dips out of frame and then somebody else dips into frame. Like, but there were some of those scenes that had to have been digitally done because they were in close up, and it was, it would have the physic, the physical nature of where they were would have been prohibitive in them doing that. Cause those, some of those big moments as disorienting as they were for me, it was more the longer they went as they got disorienting. There's a chase scene at the end and it's a puddle and it's one of the girls on one side and one of the girls on the other side. And you're just like, and the camera is like upside down and moving. And you're just like, I, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm lost and I don't know who's supposed to be where and what's going on. And I'm just and looking at like for me shadows and, and lights it, and yeah. Yeah. For me and watching it, I just, from my standpoint, it helped to put yourself in uh, Ellie's, Ellie's shoes because She's kind of in this strange, like, am I, is what I'm seeing real? Is it not real? Like, am I, am I in the 1960s or am I in present day just, you know, having a psychotic break? You know, I think that helped to portray that. I will say for me, the one thing that I absolutely loved in this is, um, John is his name. Uh, Michael Ajao. It was just a nice guy friend. He's, he's Ellie's like he, he, they meet when she's first moving into the dorm. And he offers to help, you know, and she's kind of just standoffish, like, nope, I've got it. I'm okay. He just is a genuinely nice person. 
and exactly. continues to be a genuinely nice person. Like he doesn't nice guy towards the end and get mad. He doesn't, you know, like I really did appreciate that they weren't like all of a sudden he's kind of a scumbag or he has a change in like he has ulterior motives. It's just like he's interested in her and he likes her and he's trying to get to know her and he's just being friendly and kind throughout. And he's genuinely and he stumped, worried but, when yeah. when she has her freak out in the, her yeah. Lo- her loft plot plot whatever it yeah. is the well and yeah throughout like he might make some mistakes like when Ellie tries to stab people in the face with scissors right you know? right <laughs> like right. his reaction to that isn't it's out of concern for her and it's like yes this he's isn't something's wrong her. like and he's being protective of her but in a way that's like something's going on we need to figure this out not yeah. a holy mm-hmm. crap you're crazy. And now I need to ignore you because you're you're nuts. It's something's going on. Let's figure it out. And he he just he maintains that throughout. And I actually did really appreciate that in his character. I just it, it was a refreshing thing to see rather than having him be a, a turn. You know, his character turn from good to bad the way that they did with. I forgot his name already. The other guy, Doctor Who. Jack. You know, Doctor Who Jack. starts out as as Jack. The, yeah, Jack. Yeah. He starts oh out as the it. suave business manager for the singer who's, you know, genuinely interested in her and, and she's won him over and then he's just a pimp. Yeah. But and let's be honest. We could all see that coming from a mile away. I mean, and if we want to go through seeing through things a mile away, I really tried not to think too much about this movie as I was watching it, but I saw everything coming a mile away. And that was me. I like, I wasn't actively trying to ignore things, but I wasn't really thinking through things. And I was just like, okay, yep. She's going to think that, Terrence Stamp, you know, the old guy is him and he's not going to be him. And then they introduced in one of the flashbacks, the undercover cop guy. And it's like, oh, that's going to be him. That's obvious. Like the old lady's obviously the young girl, you know, um, Sandy's the old landlady. Like all of it just kind of fell into place. Like you're like, yep, that's okay. This is not surprising in any way. You touched on the friend part and that was something that I did like as well. I liked that, you know, he, he was a genuine person that did care and that it didn't seem like he had big ulterior motives. Like, Oh, I'm going to just be really nice to you, but then flip a switch later in the movie and turn out to be a complete jerk. Like he really did care for her and what was going on with her. And how realistic do you think that is? Out of the things Which, in this movie, I would say it's probably the most realistic thing in this movie. <laughs> oh, the, I, what a, I, but like, how how realistic is it that like he's gonna still be that committed? You know, as soon as we see him in the beginning, like he's just trying to, like he's that genuine good person that has an interest in her, and he's like trying yeah. to to figure out how to connect with her. Um, And then even after she like starts going through all the craziness, like he's still that way. And it's like, like, why is he like, I want to know why is he still invested in trying to maintain a relationship with her when he doesn't really have any strong connection that we've seen yet, just that we know he's interested. And like, to me, that's what I would want to see is, well, and to kind of, if we want to transition into dislikes, I mean, I, I feel yeah, like that's, that's overall an issue with this this film is that they don't really build up the characters very well. We really don't know a ton about them, and there isn't a lot of focus on um, building the depth of any of the characters, I feel like. Yeah, um, it's, it's all a lot of surface level stuff. Yeah, I, I feel like it's it's more about just forcing the story along. And to me, the, the, the plot and the story feels very forced. Um, it's like they're being just pushed to go along and nothing's really built up. And there's like a lot of questions I have about yeah. their characters. Like, like even like the mom, like I would want to know like, like, what's that all about? Like, what's like what happened with her mom? And like, what did what was her 
psychotic issues or like what struggles did she have? Like, I mean, they just touch on it and then they, they kind of mention like, Oh, are you seeing her in the mirror again? Or are you seeing her? And like, they don't even go into that. Like they just like put a little, a little treat out there and then like, don't, don't do anything with it. And I I feel like there's a lot of that sprinkled in, but then they never follow up and build any depth to it, which makes the characters feel really shallow. Well, and the mom is only ever there in the reflection a couple of times at the beginning and a, like once at the end and that's it. Yeah. Like, so while her daughter's like, she's there like, Oh, I'm proud of you. You're doing all these great things. But while she's going through all of this traumatic stuff, the ghost isn't there. So it's like, well, it's, is it a ghost? Is it just a vision? Is it, she just imagining it, you know, like, because she can't just be imagining everything going on. Although potentially she could be. And I mean, she's an unrealistic narrator and that's, that's the problem you have with those kinds of stories is you're seeing it all from her perspective and her perspective is broken. Yeah. Like really, did she just find the diary of the crazy lady and she's been reading it at night and then having dreams about it. And it's not really happening. I mean, they, they really expect the viewer to, come up with their own interpretations for a ton of things in this movie, which I I feel like, like that's fine in, in certain cases, but I feel like the entire movie is almost that way, which I feel like it gives it a disservice. Like you've got to have some grounding points in the plot to try and to build off of and yeah. not not everything is just well it's kind of it's crazy and stylized and just I, just yeah. come up with whatever you want you can just make up your yeah. own mind well we've talked about that a lot you know either there's a difference between being vague and being ambiguous and um one of the things we talk about a lot too is like if i have to fill in the gaps of your movie i'm just going to make up my own movie like i don't need to watch your movie because i have my own imagination and that's I don't think this one was quite that bad, but there was just, it was, there was so much going on that they didn't focus on the characters. They focused on the events. And so. then I feel like the events, as you go into it, the events get repetitive. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh, another running scene oh, running from stuff. Like, okay, well, there's only so many times you can do that. And you'd be like, I don't care anymore. Well, and especially with the jump scares, and I'll use that term loosely because they were attempts at jump scares. It was really more just let's make it loud. Yeah. And it wasn't there wasn't anything like that was phone. genuinely like scary. the phone ringing like that. Yeah. Or the well, alarm. Or yeah. The alarm like, or that's just she's standing in the she's standing in the bathroom and she turns to her left and all the ghosts are standing there and it's just loud. And you're like, mm-hmm. I, this wasn't startling. I'm just annoyed that all of the sudden it's really loud Mm -hmm. for a second. And then it's done. And you can actually hear the audio level decrease. Yeah. Like after it's loud. Yeah. It's like, okay. And it's just, it's like jump scares. Loud is not scary. And honestly, in this day and age, jump scares, you've really, really got to set the tone before you start doing jump scares. A lot of my problems stem from the unknown of without with things not being explained like you know Ellie with her visions because it's not explained if this is really happening that she's really seeing the past or if it's just a dream of it and she makes her own assumption because I think like is she psychic we we don't know and the whole workings of the visions because there are moments where they're one in the same in the same body experiencing the same event and other moments she's outside the body spectating it and then there's other moments where she's interacting with the dream so that's part of my dislike is there's no consistent explanation of how the visions work Or what's even happening in them. Because has she always had the ability to 
interact with these dreams and she just hasn't done it? Or is it something like she's getting stronger in the vision and so she's getting more power or like whatever? There's no explanation to how these visions work. And I think that's kind of frustrating for me because it's not consistent. And so it's almost like you can just do whatever you want. Well, and, and there's no barriers to basically confine you into, like a set of rules to confine you into yeah. how it works. And, and we well, don't and, know, like, like it shifts all the time, right? Like, like, yeah. like you yeah. mentioned, whether she's in the dream with the other girl, whether she is the girl. And then there's like, she's in reality, seeing things and interacting around yeah. other people. Yeah. Well, the other thing to go along with that, because it's, uh, it's pretty subtle, but she starts seeing those specific ghosts before she ever goes to that house. So the first night that she's there, she goes to the dorm. She's, they go out drinking and she stops by the, the phone booth and she sees Terrence Stamp's old man character. Um, but before she, the reason that she looks over at him is, is because she sees someone in a bowler hat first. And so she sees some of those, there's some of those ghostly visions around that she sees before she ever even goes to that house. And so it's one of the things where it's like the old lady makes this point, And this is where it kind of gets weird for me as well is this is London. Someone has died in every room in every house and on every street corner. Why is it this specific vision that comes through? Why is it this specific person who had, you know, like why did, why was she drawn to that place? What's going on? Like, she was having nightmares and visions and seeing things before she ever even got there. So, and then they use the it, whole plot device of the she didn't like living in the dorms because of yeah. the partying, and so, and the one roommate that they just made her unlikable to push just her to, her to move out. That just like I feel like they're that that was just used to move the story along to move her into yeah. that that uh, upper room. Well, because like, yeah, they kept trying to make her like mean girls throughout. Like every time she's in class, and you're just kind of like, yeah, she's like a one upper. What's like? Oh like, yeah, and it's just I have that too. I'm, yeah, mine's so worse than yours. But it's just kind of like why? Why have you singled this person out who's? Hasn't really interacted with you. And that's She's the thing as well. Like, like, they're just put together. It's like, yeah, bum, they're put bum, together. Bum. And then she removes herself from the situation, but the girl continues to go after her. Yeah. And continues to. Yeah. And it's just like, it seems like you would have forgotten she existed pretty quick. But they don't. And they don't like try and do anything with that kind of nasty relationship between them. They yeah. just like, whenever they're there, it's like, you know, they don't like each other and. Blah, and that's it. Yeah. It's like, okay, got it. Yeah. Until, you know, she tries to stab her in the face when she's going after the ghosts. But, 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 but it's, that, it's cheap. It's, yeah, it, nothing, nothing pays off because you don't care about any of these characters. Mm-hmm. You, know? you know, it's all surface level, just kind of, okay, you fit this, this stereotype, you fit this stereotype, you fit this stereotype. So, and that's why I think it just becomes predictable. So, yeah the the situation with the ghosts. I think that's something that kind of really like little needled away at me is the fact that these ghosts are haunting her or visions or whatever we want to call them because it's still unknown. Yep. But they're haunting her and they're 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 scary. And then you find out, you know, at the, the last half that they just want They're help and they help. just, and I'm just thinking, well, why are you, why are you effectively attacking her and then trying to get her to help? And then the vision well, that Elle had about Sandy being murdered was then not her being murdered, but her murdering yep. someone else. Yep. And I, that's part of the, my frustration with the whole vision situation is, is any of it true and or is it just like selective truths that she's allowed to see or, you know, yeah. what is the parameter for that? Because how can you get a false vision of a situation happening? It, it's just there's no 
there's no rules to keep it in line. And it's, it's really it's, frustrating. It's the struggles of having an unreliable narrator, right? We're following her perspective. And so her interactions with everybody could be realistically could be completely different. And, you know, she sees, but that's the thing. She said she saw her murdered. The audience didn't. We saw the knife. We saw blood. We saw everything else going on in the room, but we didn't actually see that happening. Like, so it's a cheap move to try and pull over your audience. But I think by that point in time, the audience doesn't genuinely care one way or another. And it seems like it's just, it's a misdirection to try and pull you away from the twist at the end. That's not really a twist. And I think feathers, you've hit it right on the head. I think if you, they sat down with a set of rules beforehand and these are the boundaries in which we have to operate. That makes that work better. There's no hints that the old lady is Sandy other than, well, she still lives there and there's a couple of lines of dialogue where she's like, Oh yeah, I used to clean up around this town. But you're like, okay, she's obviously lying about what she used to do. Like, yeah. Just, yeah. But it makes sense in the end, but there's nothing like you barely see the old lady. She's not in the apartment until they want to show it to you. Right. At the very end, she sits down and you see the figurine that's there. That was on the mantle before, like until they start showing you those things, but they show you those things two minutes before they, the reveal right. like that doesn't build tension. That doesn't, that that's not foreshadowing. I think that's the big issue is there's no foreshadowing for the twists. And if there were, I would forgive it following an obvious path because I was like, Oh yeah, that foreshadowing is really good. This was just like, I'll bet you this is where they're going with it. And then they're going to try and distract you from it the whole time. You know, you're, you're playing a trick on the audience and the payoff makes it feel like it was a trick. Yep. The, the twist could have been yeah. so much more impactful. They could have, yeah, they could have moved things around and yeah. I think made the end a yeah. bigger payoff. So even in tying in with the, the old lady, Sandy, the idea that she was able to just kill men and then hide them in the house yeah. without anyone noticing because this is the 60s where, you know, things aren't quite as well built in oh, and, yeah. standards of, you know, construction. And bodies decompose. And bodies <laughs> decompose. And you have Jack, who was the first guy that got murdered. As soon as the second guy walked into the house for his good time, he would be smelling something. Like, and did anyone they who came allude to what she did with the bodies? She, there was there was it, a flashback it, where they were showing up in the floorboards, in the floorboards and um, in the and walls, in the walls. Yeah. and things like that. Yeah. So it's it's assumed it's a, that, and then they were breaking out of the floor and the walls. That right, like that was yeah yeah. yeah. So. I I didn't I take mean, that it, literally, but like yeah, she just put them in the floor though. I, but, but that's but that's the problem know. is is yeah. you don't yeah. know. You don't and know other than what just, they show you in a fever dream. And so you're like, okay, yeah. if I take that at face value, they're in the walls. If not, then this tiny little woman is disposing of all these bodies. Somehow. Somehow. Yeah. But that, that's like part of the point is yeah. like, you don't know. But if you do take it literally, the bodies decompose. And if anyone comes by, you're going to be smelling something. Yeah. And it's going to raise some some alarms in people's heads to be able to say, oh, what's the smell? And you follow the source of the smell and you find, I don't know, a body. Oh, you you ex ex excavate the house and you find 10 bodies or 100 bodies or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's it's yeah, it's slightly too vague. It's one of those things where I don't necessarily think you need to go into a ton of detail on those kinds of things, but. It, it's a question that's raised that derails you from the story. Because, yeah, I thought the same thing. Like, if all these guys are just hidden in the walls and in the floorboards, why, what? No. Like, this is... All right. The main character's voice from the get-go. As soon as she started talking, I just said, this is going to annoy me the entire film. And it did. I just couldn't get past that mousy little 
it didn't fit her character because she wasn't really timid. She well, shy. I, I, she was shy, and she, she 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 shied away from situations. But when confronted with things, she spoke up, and you know she didn't necessarily hide in this mousy little persona. She just l- went and lived her own life. But yeah. I don't know what it was about that voice that just uh, bugged me. I couldn't get into it, and I just I it derailed from the get go. So did ma- dislike for the character, which is tough. Because you know, I'm sure it's just her voice, but I just couldn't. I just I don't know. I just couldn't do it. Like I said, it's petty, but it's. Well, it is I, I have I have my own petty little dislike as well, yeah. and that is the the stupid stereotype against music, like, oh, this is from my era. You can't possibly like this, or oh, how old are you for liking this kind of music? And it just, it, it's one thing that always frustrates me when people do it, because it's almost like you're born at this time, you can only like music from this time onward. You're not allowed to go back into any other music. It's well, so frustrating. Or you're frustrating only allowed for, to like music that came out from the time you were about 12 to about 22. And that's yeah. it. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're never allowed to like any, any modern or older music. For me, it's it kind of so comes across a little bit more as maybe like a persecution complex, like... You know, people feel special because they like a certain thing. And then if somebody, you know, so they want to feel. If if anybody has ever made fun of them for liking that thing, then they feel like, okay, well, I'm special because I'm different for liking this thing. And so I need to show that off. I mean, especially with the song choices they chose, right? I can't believe you like this song. You're like, this is like one of the most popular songs around. And it's like, okay. Yeah, but no, I, I feel the same way yeah. with the music. Like, I tried to just kind of avoid the music as much as I could in this one because it's like I know it's going to be a big part of the movie because I know the director and what he's going to do. But yeah, it's gatekeeping. <laughs> Anything is kind of annoying, and I think people should stop doing it in general, but also should stop incorporating it into their things, into their movies, and that kind of stuff. So I'll start with like I feel like this is a sec secondary change um it wouldn't be my primary change uh but the Lindsay, the policeman and his whole character like i feel like that was a big missed opportunity to really the, use him the old guy at yeah. all in the movie yeah. beyond just <laughs> a, a scene well, here or there it, well, well exactly like like Compared to a lot of the other characters, like it's one that they they focused on and had direct interactions with the the with Ellie and him, and really was like trying to build it up. I mean, it was all on the premise that she thought he was Jack, um, yeah. ultimately. But the fact that like in the flashbacks, it's just like oh, there was just a passing oh. Oh, yep. he must have been that one guy that said that yep. one thing at that one time. But, like, they really could have incorporated him even into the flashbacks more to to really make it, like, more meaningful. But, I mean, that goes into, like, building up the characters, like, yep. what they've failed to well, do. Well, and just how unimportant his character was. Yeah, it, it I, made I, no I, difference whatsoever. IMDb lists him as silver-haired gentleman. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think they really even gave him a name. At any point, like Lindsay, not a not Lindsay, Lindsay, Lindsay? Lindsay and yeah. Lindsay in the flashback, but there was no name in the present day for no, you to the, even connect anything. The, was it the bartender? The, the bartender bar owner, yeah, said, "Oh, after this he got is hit Lindsay, by the car. After he got well, hit, yeah, yeah, he, he that, was after he got hit. But I mean, then she's like, yeah, it's not Jack. Any time before that, yeah. any time yeah. before that, there was right. no any yeah. indication of, oh, hey, it's this guy." And they did play very heavily into the fact that you would believe he was Jack because, like, the way that he acted towards Ellie, it wasn't like, oh, he used to be a police officer, so he's trying to ask you questions or anything. It's just he's super creepy about it. Exactly. So it's yeah, yeah. It's like so. So I I feel like how much they use that character compared to like the rest of the characters, like yeah, they didn't get their money's worth with what they invested mm-hmm. into that character. And it was just like, yeah. Oh no, it wasn't Jack. Nope. 
Oh, yeah. it was that one guy that you saw that one time in the dream. Yep. And oh, oops. Like, and somehow uh, he was supposed to be important into this mystery that you're supposed to figure out, but you're maybe not figuring out this mystery. We yeah. don't know what. Yeah. Like, I, I felt like, like, yeah, there, there was a lot of waste there. I could have been. I feel like that added a lot more to it. It's a missed opportunity, especially within the actor, um, but also just within the character. Like, cut out some of the BS with the stupid college kids. Like, you know, attempted mean girl situation. Like. Cut that out of the film. Build in more of the other things. You know, build up more. Well, I, I feel like it could have it could have added to creating a better uh-huh. twist in the end, which yeah. would probably be my my main change. Would be to yeah re, revamp that whole I, yeah. situation. Well, that was like I was struggling thinking through what I would change about the movie because I got to the end of it and I was just like I'm just pissed off because of the loud noises. Like yeah. <laughs> Because I wanted it to be scary, and it wasn't scary. It was just like somebody shouting in my face all of a sudden. Um, but this is supposed to be a horror movie. But I would have switched it to be more of a thriller and make it more of a mystery. Like she's trying to figure out what's going on and less of a horror. And that's... Or go full bore into the horror. She's not trying to figure out what happened. She's just trying to stop the ghosts from getting her. And I think that's what, like, I walked into this thinking it was supposed to be more of, like, a psychological thriller and not even, like, a horror movie aspect of it. And then as I'm watching it, I'm realizing, oh, I guess this is supposed to be more of a horror movie. But they didn't play up into that. They didn't, because my my biggest struggle with this is, you know, there there are no rules, boundaries being set up within the visions, and there's no character buildup. And I think that if you... I know the point of the school is just to kind of show like she wanted to be a fashion designer and things like that. But if you eliminated a lot of that aspect and maybe just like throw some things here and there, but then built up this mystery that she's trying to solve and figure out. Because when you find out that Sandy was one that got murdered, it's like there's probably what, 30 minutes left in a two hour long movie and then she's trying to figure out, oh, this she died, so I need to find Jack because he was one that killed her, and I need to solve this mystery. If you kind of just start at the beginning as, you know, work... You, I don't even know if I would do it this way, but theoretically, if you start out with her witnessing the murder and then events leading up to the murder and then her trying to figure it out that way, maybe that would help to, you know, do anything with this. Because there's no, there's no character development in it. Yeah. You're just given, you're just given players, and they give slight little information in their backstories, but not enough for you to care about them. I would have liked to have seen more of the thriller part of it, of her trying to figure out this murder that she witnessed it the first night that she slept at this, this flat, this this house, mm-hmm. this room, whatever, and. Then she's trying to figure out what happened. Yeah. And that was, that was, was the interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's where it got interesting was when she was finally look, trying to figure out what was going on rather than just experiencing things. Yeah. yeah. And that's what it was. Like it was an hour and a half of her just experiencing and then finally being like, oh, wait, I need to do something about this. She, it felt like she was still just experiencing things, but trying to force her way through them. Like, I mean, she turns down a date with Mr. Nice Guy at the to beginning experience she, to go back and experience with, the second yeah the, the second date with um Sandy and Jack like you know and, and because the event was real but not real like i guess that t- so technically she she can be interacted with in the dreams cuz she had the hickey yeah but then that never became a thing ever again they they don't take the time to wrap up what Ellie's mental issue is they yep. allude to that she has a family history of it with her mother, and they kind of throw that in there without any real explanation. Um, but then they, they they go through all of the, the dream stuff and the craziness, but they don't they don't come down at the end and say like was. 
everything that she went through based on her mental issues? Was it like a supernatural force? Like, was it something else? They just leave it open. It's like you really set it up that it's a mental problem. Yeah. Like that she's having like a psychotic break, uh, something serious, but then they just like never conclude anything around it. Yeah. And so with, with everything that they built up at the beginning, like, like you can't tell me that like they didn't intend to say she's having mental problems or it's not based in reality. Like, you can't ladle that on in the beginning and then just be like, oh, like, we just, Dude. we're trying to trick you. Yeah. Like, yeah. come on, you didn't well, explain anything. I mean, yeah. I think yeah. that's but what that's a lot of it came down the... to, where I think it was just, like, things were thrown out there to try and trick the audience and to yeah. make them go, like, one route, but in reality they were trying to go somewhere else. And that's what I think a lot of it felt like, is just a, a means to trick the audience without actually having it make sense. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's, that's, uh, that's my biggest issue with this is that it's, it's sleight of hand levels of misdirection. And it's just, it's look over here, look over here, look over here. Cause what we're really, you know, this twist, we're just not even going to allude to it in any way. And it's so blatantly obvious that we should do something different, but we're going to just do that anyway. Yeah. Like, I, I think it feels equally as cheap. Cause I'm just thinking through other changes. Like, if at the end the grandmother shows up and it's, she's talking to the police officers and they're like, yeah, we don't know what's going on. She it's burned down the this house old lady's herself. house. Yeah. And, you know, the grandma's like, well, she said that there were this, you know, somebody's trying to corroborate Ellie's story that right. this old lady was a murderer and there were bodies in the house. And they're like, there were no remains in the house. She didn't live here in the 60s. Like she was in the army or, you know, something like that, yeah. you know, that kind of a thing. It could have been that like, like the old lady didn't even exist. Like, and she yeah. was just like squatting in a vacant house or something. Yeah. I, I feel like that would have been equally as cheap, but yeah. it would have at least been some kind of an explanation as to what was going on. And I don't really like that explanation. I think I like the world it being more that it was a supernatural force, but it's a pretty strong supernatural force. And why would it pick her and not anybody else who's ever stayed there? Or, you know, it's, there's no like rules. You'd have to make that connection there's, or that yeah. reason. Yeah. This, there's no this, foundation this that holds that, this story up. This is something that I'll just say, I had a thought about it as I was watching it is the, the old lady, um, Sandy had mentioned that, yeah, there are people here that had stayed, but then they, you know, left in the middle of the night and just bailed. So I can only imagine that maybe they were having the same psychotic they, visions yeah. and things like that, but it's not explained. But you could theoretically jump to that conclusion I, that. Yeah, know, I mean, that's yeah. that's probably what they were getting at with those kinds of things is that people just left. You know, inexplicably, but it could also be that she was they, they found out and she was murdering them or. Yeah, it could be anything because. Yeah. But it's not know. explained. That's the point. Yeah. You know, and maybe rather than having the old man misdirect, have it have been somebody who had stayed there previously who finds out that she's staying there and that's the interaction and that leads to more of the story. And they're like, oh, yeah, crazy things happen there. And this is what happened. You know, like there's a hundred different ways you could have done these things to make it more impactful. And I think yeah. that's my biggest disappointment with this movie is. I think if they had done any one of those things, it would have been better. It seems like they've really just built this off of wanting to play with the effects of person in the mirror yep. reliving somebody else's story. And yeah. And everything else was secondary to that. That's uh, our thoughts on one night in Bangkok. And I'm sticking to it. That that's the name of this movie. And <laughs> so sorry that you listened to one movie. Listen, instead last of last night the in Soho. Um, anyway, let us know your thoughts down below, and uh, we'll catch you guys in the next one. Adios. See you.